talk, uh, continue talking about HIV, but I will share with you one of the works that our lab is doing. So please interrupt me anywhere if you we don't get through it. Um, if you have questions, please ask me. So on uh, the topic of HIV, uh, last time we finished about latency and maybe a curse uh, when uh, HIV infected cells stop uh, people living with HIV, taking antiretroviral therapy. It stops viral replication and cell might go into latency. What it means is that cell may be replicating, but it just does not replicate viral reservoir. So what it means is um, cell is not showing any signs of being infected, but it can still divide and divide HIV with it. It just doesn't present it anyhow. So immune system does not know that the cell is infected and it needs to be eliminated. So what can we do about it? So people can continue taking antiretroviral therapy, but it does not eliminate viral reservoir. So in order to do so, we have to somehow forcefully reactivate that viral reservoir, a latent cell uh, reactivate them, and forcefully make them appear or show any symptoms of being infected. So then the immune system can recognize them and target them. So in order to do so, people started investigating uh, latency reversing agents. So this is specific small drugs that work somehow on viral on the cell cycle to forcefully reactivate it viral reservoir and force cell out of a uh, stable cycle and force it out of, um, um, I guess, force it to reactivate and start producing a star replicate. In order to do that, we use a single cell. We look at every single cell and uh, its genomic transcripts, uh, both link node resident CD4 cells. So again, just, just as I mentioned before, why is it so hard to eradicate or eliminate HIV in general? Because HIV integrates into the whole cell genome, and when it integrates into our whole cell genome, it can integrate absolutely anywhere. It can integrate in the middle of some kind of gene, after gene, and some uh, neutral with uh, learn from some biology before, it's the uh, introns, exons in every gene. Intron is the one that does not really have much of a, well, introns actually have very important information, exons don't, so it depends where it integrates, it might be sliced out and kicked out, or it might be usefully active. And in the meantime, it can eliminate the function of the actual gene that we need it in our body. So it could be, we can don't, don't have any control with can integrate. And then establishing viral reservoir means that there are a bunch of cells that constantly produce an HIV. That's what means reservoir. It means that a body of cells that constantly have HIV. And that there is a heterogeneity of viral reservoir at cell and chemical levels. And what it means is that HIV has very, very small genome. The rest of it is used from people. So while it's replicating, it's introducing a lot of mutations. So in the, every single individual, we might have a lot of different viral sequences. So that's why we call them viral swarms, because it's not identical. And on a topical level, it means, um, as I just said, HIV can integrate any cell in any organ. And the primary organs to harm viral reservoir is new fossil levels, such as uh, genital tracts, um, um, gut, and also lymph nodes, so any possible lymph nodes. And the reason for that is that when we talk, when we talk about cross-talk cross between cells, the majority of that cross-talk happens is in lymph nodes. So T cells, as soon as they encounter infection, they come into a lymph node and they talk to B cells and other T cells and uh, antigen presenting cells, ABCs. That cross talk happens in the lymph nodes. And what else has happened is B cells, when they produce antibodies, they refine lymph nodes, lymph nodes. So that's why the lymph node is, is a major anatomical organ to harbor latent reservoir. So, as I mentioned, antiretroviral therapy it suppresses viral replication, but it does not eliminate infected cells. It cannot do that. And HIV persists in presence of ARS. So, even if people taking antiretroviral therapy, not every single cell is suppressed. Uh, we just cannot control it. So, what can we do? There's one of the strategies, such as uncover and eliminate. 
So if we imagine this is place and an RNA response is not working. So if this is the genome, it's such as any our cell, the blue part, it was the white part, is the HIV genome. So as you see, it's integrated. But the cell doesn't show any symptoms or any signs of being infected. So what we can do is shock the cell with the latency reversion agent, and that forcefully uh, makes cells to start replicating. And while it's replicating, the natural things for cells to do, or for HIV uh, genome to do, is produce viral particles, not fully formed, but fully viral proteins. And these viral proteins get assembled on the cell surface. That's what a natural cycle of HIV is. It sends all the proteins to the cell surface, they assemble there, and they bot out, they like break out of the cell. So before, before they assemble into virion and bot out, that's when the immune system can recognize it. Our antibodies can now detect the cell as getting infected and, and uh, target it for elimination. So a lot of these drugs, that's shocking drugs called latency reversing agents. A lot of companies and groups and universities have been working, uh, and it actually came from um, some of their research came from cancer from a long time ago. When you reactivate cell and forcefully um, go making it to go into transcription, you can activate any possible gene, absolutely any, because it just works on the transcription or translation. And that's a normal cycle of the cell. So if you force it, then you can just make, especially in the cancer field, you can just produce more and more of uh, cancer-related proteins and uh, cancer cells, and therefore you can force a person to expire very really soon. So a lot of researchers are thinking, can we reactivate specific genes, or can we reactivate specific pathways? So same with a similar thing, people with HIV start saying, can we target HIV somehow? So the drugs have been refined so much that it does reactivate the cell. And what it does is our cell has several levels. Transcription is when we take DNA and produce RNA. Translation, when that RNA is used as template to produce proteins. So these are major steps in every single cell cycle, in, in a life cycle. So they start saying, can we specifically target something with HIV? So they refine these drugs. And now these drugs still work on the cell. It's, it's kind of uh, forcing, it, forcing, forcing it to reactivate transcription and translation, but somehow it specifically targets cells with HIV. So we decided to look, what can we do with this drug? So again, there's a bunch of latency reversing agents, and they work with different parts. So one of them is marina sat. It actually, in clinical, it's been approved by FDA to use. It's a hydroxymate uh, HDOC inhibitor. So what it means is when our, when our DNA tightly packed uh, uh, about histones, so histones is a small protein, and our DNA is tightly packed around it. I don't have the images here, probably I should have, but I'm going to explain it in my hands. So it's a, it's a, a small protein that we have a lot, and DNA is tightly packed around it, as, as, as imagine it's like a uh, um, spring. It's tight with that, and there is so many of them, and that forms chromatin. And what, what happens is we have uh, acetylase on top, and it kind of cleaves a lot of uh, remaining parts of our DNA to make our DNA pop really tightly. So what this varietal has done, it prevents this cleavage, so it leaves this chromatin a little bit open. So that's what it does for this side. Another one is the inhibitor. It's an antagonist of an inhibitor of apoptosis. So there is, this is inhibitor of an inhibitor. So we have inhibitor of apoptosis protein, protein that prevents the apoptosis of the cell, and you inhibit the inhibitor. So what it does is reactivates the cell that was targeting non-canonical and alpha B, and producing all target effects and improving safety over agents that activate normal NF-CoV-B. So the reason is, if you start thinking about transcription and translation, NF-CoV-B is a tiny, tiny little protein that goes into a nucleus and activates transcription. That's the typical state of canonical NF-CoV-B, and that's what our most of the cells use. So somehow, it's related to HIV, there is another way, non-canonical NF-CoV-B. So if you block that pathway, 
you can still reactivate the cells, and it's it's making uh, cells reactivate in a very mild way without reactivating a lot of other genes. So R15 is actually a cytokine. It's what we produce. In fact, all our T cells produce cytokines. It's very important for function of our immune cells, such as NK cells. But it has been shown that it's not necessarily linking to reversing agents, but it's priming our immune system. So when it does it, it actually works on all the cells, including CD4 cells that, that uh, harbor in China. And another one, I bet inhibitor, also, um, it's, it's it's another part of the transcription and translation, and it does it works without cellular activation. So all of these drugs have been shown in the lab to work primarily on HIV and have very mild effects. And people, when they test it in the lab, just like we, we all do in science, you've seen our lab, we work with some cells. For primarily, cells who work with CDSPs or the work the cells that we get from blood. It's called peripheral. But what happens when we use the drugs on cells in distal organs, such as lymph nodes, or the muscle parts, or reproductive tract? So luckily for us, we closely affiliate with the transplant center. And uh, you probably know that Duke is the very first institution that did a transplant for HIV people living with HIV. So before, uh, only uh, non-HIV people could get a transplant. But now, uh, they decided, well, if one person has an HIV and another person has an HIV and there is a need of the organ, why can't we just do it? This way, we protect uh, integrity, we protect um, uh, morally people with, without HIV, but then we still save people living with HIV. And that's what happened. The very first kidney transplant happened here. So now, when we have uh, people living with HIV organ recipients, a lot of organs have to be excised. So, for instance, kidneys don't usually get inside, they get pushed, or pushed away, and then you keep to get inserted. But lungs and uh, lymph nodes, they, they, have to, they have to be removed. And the reason, maybe you already understand why, because it harbors a lot of immune cells. So, if you insert a new organ that is foreign, what your immune system will do, will attack it. So, you have to remove all uh, a, a proximal lymph nodes to eliminate as much as possible native immune system. In addition, people take a little bit of suppressive drug to help the new organ get up here. So we, as thinking about it, as a, we take those organs and we do research. And prior to transplant, patients have to be on an antiretroviral therapy. They have to be as healthy as possible, considering they still need a transplant, but they have suppressed, immune, suppressed a viral load of HIV. So in HIV, kind of perspective, they are healthy as much as possible. So we take those organs and we start asking questions. All the research has been done with the cell lines, with artificial cells or periphery. But what happens if we give this latent to reverse the agents to the organs that matter the most, that harbor HIV? So since we cannot work uh, with, uh, uh, with a lot of animals, we start saying, can we just take these organs from people and do research with them? So that was one of the very first things we did, is we collected a lot of lymph nodes from organ transplant recipients of chronically infected people living with HIV that had been suppressed for at least six months with undetectable viral. So this is as well as you go. Know, if you would like to treat people on antiretroviral therapy, this is how they would look like. So we took those organs and we asked the major two questions. We wanted to determine the effect of latent seroversion agents all the way from now on on the lymph node resident CD4 cells. And after we use the latent seroversion agents, can we identify markers that is now expressed by latently infected cells that can be used to eliminate them? So, and how we would do it, we would perform single cell transcriptomic analysis to identify either membrane expressed markers or metabolic pathways that are specifically activated uh, by those latently infected cells. All right. Yes. So, what should be viral load? So, viral load should be undetectable. Undetectable, like, is there like a. So, I think the limit of detection now is 
50 copies per meal or 20 copies per meal. And I think it's a, the most sensitive kit that exists. So if it's below that, it's just called undetectable. And it might be lower, which is skin detected. And if it's higher, then we see that the person is viremic.
is to, for the cell to express any antigen of cell surface. It's our hope. That's our, it's a dream. And we know this ultimately happens because HIV, like, unlike other viruses, it doesn't make viral particles inside the cell and just shoot them up. What it does, it sends all the proteins to the cell surface and then it just buzz up. So inevitably, it will sell the proteins to the cell surface. And while it's in the cell surface, it takes time for it to buy out. During that process, this part can be recognized by antibodies. So transcription translation step is very short. By producing the virus and making it to the cell surface, that is kind of long term. Uh, in long term, I'm saying it could be hours, could be days. And that's when it can be recognized by antibodies. But will that happen? We don't know. But when we do this with periphery cells with cell lines, that's what we have to But that's not a question. Now we work with completely different, we still see these four cells, but they are in a completely different order. We don't know much about the cells because people didn't pay attention much to them. So we want to see whatever we determined before with blood cells and with the cell line, we can reproduce in with. So now I'm going into experiment how we went about it. So we collected lymph node cells, and you know by now that HIV does not infect every cell. And lymph node is the whole organ. It has a lot of things. It has adhesive cells, like fibers. It has T cells and B cells. It has CD4s and cd 8 It has a lot of different and myeloid cells and NK cells. It has a lot of different cells. But HIV infects and leaves only C4. So what we did, we isolated C4 cells. And then we activated the latest server agents just for 24 hours. In fact, it was overnight. We set it up in around the afternoon and we came back and, and checked it in the morning. So what we did here is we left the cells untreated, the necessary control, and then we mixed two drugs. So in the previous page here, this is this is all major drugs. So what we did is we mixed two of them, Brian and ADD, which were the most interesting and showed previously some uh, uh, result in not human pregnant studies. We also added IL 15 that also showed it didn't really reactivate for the more, but it showed positive effects on cells. So we included that. And we included IBAT. So IBAT works with a completely different part of the transcription, but we wanted to, and it's very toxic. But at this point, we wanted to see can we see any effect, and importantly, is None of these cells are HIV positive. When you just harvest with those cells, they just sell. None of them look like they infected with HIV. But the person was chronically infected for many, many years. So we said, if we shock these cells with the cells with all the slaving server agents, can we detect at least one, one HIV positive cell? And the pre-story is before, we took exactly the same mean cells, just one. And you shock it with very, very toxic CD4 activator. It's not latent to reverse nature. It's something that people use a lot. We reactivated the film for hours, and we detect zero inches. But what we did next, we took the same cells, and we just cultured them. Cultured and cultured and cultured. And we added some CD4 cells to see if it gets cross infected. And after two or three weeks, we got a lot of tons of HIV infections. So what we showed in the lab that somewhere there there was HIV cells, and after culturing them in the lab for three weeks, not only did they produce the virus, the virus viral particles were so infectious they infected other cells and they got expanded. But when we used that same cells for 24 hours with the activation, we detected zero HIV. So after that very sad experiment, we said, okay, we're doing it again. But now we use the latency reversing agents that we use in cleaning that are more optimized and they have very little effect. And let's just combine, just combine, and let's see if we can do anything. So at this point, we had two questions. What effect latency reversing agents have on CD4 cells from lymph nodes? Can we identify at least any HIV? So what we did now is probably, I don't know if they have lectures about uh, uh, RNA stick. But yeah, will they at some point? Uh, it's that, I, I think you're the most like basic science uh, So nobody, um, Josh, Tyler, 
Nobody gave my turn. Okay. Well, I'm going to say, because I also don't know much, but it's, it's one of the advice. So this was a lot of this work was done with um, birth board and body side group, actually pretty much all involved here that was working on it. So we did gene expressional analysis. It's when we looked at the very single cell and we sequenced the genome and we looked at expression in any possible genes that were expressed. And we looked also at TCR. So TCR in every CD4 cell is the molecule. And this molecule is unique to that CD4 cell. And if it ever encountered HIV, that receptive T cell receptor, that was uh, TCR, T cell receptor, it will be unique to specific HIV epitope and then stay there. Unlike antibodies that get refined, refined, the CD4 cells, they just keep it forever. So if you ever find or take cells from a person with HIV, and then you look at those T cell receptor, which is tiny little things that the CD4 cells, you will see what those cells specific to. And not just that they're specific to HIV, which part of HIV is. So we wanted to see if we can find out, and since we used three different people, we want to see if there is any dominant thing, meaning that if there is any part of HIV that's so stood out to your immune system that three different people can make very similar or recognize similar. So we, we sequenced all of this for every single cell, and we did a single cell analysis. Are you going to explain what? I'm trying to try. Okay. Well, I'll try to the best my ability. So what we did is we combined. We we did the same. What I said, we took cells from three people living without HIV and three people living with HIV. So people living with HIV, people living without HIV. So we mixed all of the cells together, and they all were sequenced. Uh, we actually, in the tube, which I showed you in the lab, in the tube, we sent one million cells. But when we sent it for sequencing, special sequencing for they only sequenced 10,000 cells. So I just wanted to show you that how, how what a funnel is. You have a person that is back to the HIV, and HIV can be in any possible order. We only took a one link. From link nodes, we isolated two. We, we isolated about a few million CD4 cells, but we treated only one million cells. And then we sequenced only 10 cells. How little it is. So every single cell was sequenced, but throughout the sequencing, literally you're taking some short part of DNA and it's sequencing throughout the whole cell. And that's what single cell analysis is. And out of six individuals, you would think that six individuals give you 20,000 cells each. You would have approximately 120,000, but we only received 97,000 cells. So that means that some of, some of them don't. So this is how the analysis looks like. So every single dot that you see here is a cell. And what single cell analysis does is it takes all possible cells and based on the gene expression in every cell, it positions them either close or far away. So this is all statistical approach. You take those sequences, you plug it in into a system that is designed to analyze single cells, and it's just analyzing a lot of gene expression, it's a gene throughout all the cells, and if they're really, really close to each other, it forms a side of cluster. That's what it's called cluster in analysis. But just by based on gene expression, there's no any other parameters. The statisticians didn't touch anything. It just used the native gene analysis, gene expression of each cell. And if they were close, they put them close. If there are some differences between them, they're going to put them apart. And for instance, these clusters are closer to each other, but they kind of far away from these. This is so far away. So the, the further they are from each other, the more different it is. And what we noticed is completely two different clusters. Not just clusters, it was completely two different sections. So each of these is a cluster, and they number, but they separated by complete distance. So we were really interested to know what is happening. Um, what, is, what is happening here? So each, each dot is a cell. This is six people in total. You don't know which cells are. 
we become self in the imposter. So that's what we did for the rest of them. It was very minor difference between cluster 1 and 11, and that was very similar to cluster 3, 5 was very close to 9, and so forth, 15 to 15. So when we found such similarities, we said, what can we do now? Can we combine them somehow and check if there is any effect on cells? And that's what we did. We did bulk pseudo, uh, pseudo bulk, it means when we artificially, the statistician just found cells in the cluster 2 and found cells in the cluster 4 and combined them together. And this way, we take outside the activation state and we just look at native transcripts of the cell. And um, sadly, there is another uh, statistical approach, we will move to cover differential analysis. I, I will not go into a deep um, explanation what it is, but what we did is we either checked uh, transcripts uh, from overall already fat and gene expression, and then we did the same thing for people living with HIV. And the reason we did it is if we just administer uh, our race to people, to people in general, we wanted to know what that fact is. And then if, if there is a very drastic bad effect on the link node cell, but maybe we should stop altogether. But then if there is a fine effect, what it does specifically to people living with HIV, because ultimately we're not going to give it to general population as a vaccine, we're going to give it to people to treat uh, eliminated HIV. So that's what that was our goal. So, and I'll t I'll show you why. I don't want to spoil it right now. Maybe I should. So maybe I maybe I will go through it from that. But yeah, we just them. This we really didn't care about. So what what we did when we treat when we look at this, we wanted to see a fact of each array combination. So assuming uh, you probably know the Venn diagram. So this is assuming that these are all transcripts that were articulated when cells were treated specifically with this LRA combination and this LRA combination, this LRA combination. So all together, we found that all of them had very, very similar articulation of transcripts when we just looked at the cluster 2 and the cluster 4. So we found that there was 50% match between uh, variants of ATT and when we take four drugs together. And it's 34% similarity when we combine all them together. So what it shows, it means that regardless of which combination we use, we have very, very similar articulation or differentially expressed transcripts. So that means the treatment was very similar. And just to let you know again, all of the treatments had variants suddenly. And there was absolutely no difference when we add L15. So as previously was shown, it didn't really have effect on reactivation. It had some kind of state on on um, immune cells state, but it didn't really have effect on reactivation. So we did very similar analysis to all other clusters, and what we noticed overall is that all of them had very similar uh, uh, differentially expressed transfers between all the treatments. So that means that the majority of reactivation was driven by variety of the combination, because it was in all the treatments. So since we had very similar upregulation, we differentially expressed some of them upregulated, some of them downregulated, we wanted to know what they are. So and next we wanted to see what are the top significant upregulated transcripts in our treated cells in each pair across people living without HIV and with HIV. So the reason I'm focusing now on upregulated is because I understand that sometimes transcripts can be downregulated. It means that you suppress the expression of some kind of GHC in the transcript. But as I said before, and going back to the question, how can we identify these cells? We want them to express something in the cell membrane that was not there before. How can it be if you upregulate them? So that's why we said, forget about downregulation. But if we treat people, we will never see what downregulated. But if we see something upregulated, that's what the immune system can detect. If something downregulated inside the cell, we just won't be able to see. But if it's upregulated, that's what gets detected. So we said, let's just focus on that. And that's what we did. So again, we went cluster by cluster, and we looked at the top 10 transcripts for each treatment. And we did notice some similarities. 
So these are top 10 genes, but as you can see, some of them are not top 10. It means that these are top 10 for this cluster and for this and for this, and a lot of them overlap. The process means that it didn't come up for this treatment or it didn't come up for this treatment, but it was the top 10 in this treatment. So as you can see, a lot of filled, the gaps are filled. That means there was a lot of similarity in the regulation of transcript among the treatments for each cluster compared. And then we started saying, what are those transcripts? So we started looking specifically what they mean, and then, yes, they still mean upregulation. They still mean reactivation, um, but none of them actually related to any cell surface markers. Some of them related to autophagy. It means that uh, internal signal for cells to die. Some of them related to apoptosis. So it's, again, internal signal cells to die which is great for the cell to be dead if it's HIV infected, but we won't be able to recognize it. And the signals were not that strong. So our next question was, uh, okay, well, it's, it's again, very similar cheese. I don't want to go into details, but they were very similar across all the treatments. So that means that cells were separated from the cluster, but regardless which cluster we look at, we still notice similar Transcripts. So cells were separated based on the differentiation, but we still notice something similar. So it was it was very interesting for us to go into every single of these genes and find the importance. And when we did it, we didn't find significant importance for elimination of the late between cells. So then we said, okay, well, what about pathways? We looked at every single gene separately. But are those genes somehow related to pathway? That means that maybe there is a, a, a secretion of something to the cell surface or um, glycosylation of some proteins. If there is a specific pathway, and the reason I'm saying it is we might not detect every single cell in the region, but if cell activated a specific pathway and it's somehow related to, for instance, glycosylation of proteins, we may then give people glycosylation related inhibitors that will affect only HIV cells, and they will be forced to die. So this is one of these uh, examples. So again, pathway analysis considers all transcripts regardless of the significance. So we looked at the gene ontology is one of the pathway analysis that provides molecular function of gene. And then I'm going to go quickly, but what we noticed again is you see completely identical upregulated transcripts. So cells were separated, but we identified very similar uh, pathways. Again, it didn't help us at all. So what it means is that there is a lot of differences in gene transcripts, but on overall, latent reversing agents are regulated what is known to be, what is expected, and it didn't have major effect. It had major effects on all of them. We didn't find something peculiar about any so then we want to see if there are any different, if there are so much similarity, what are the differences? And there were a few differences, but again, it was related to either protein containing complex localization or right or uh right so it was not something we can go after when we're trying to treat patients with HIV. So we said, okay, well, if there are differences in uh array combinations, can we identify additional effects? So, as you know, we have our that ADC everywhere. We wanted to have additional effects on other drugs, and that's what we did. So, if we compare just Varanus at ADC with L15 compared to parental, there was no difference. As I said before, L15 didn't do anything in the gene transcript. But we found some in red, we found some different or uh, similar population when we added IPAD or L15 and IPAD. That means that that difference was probably driven by IPAD. But regardless, there are also downregulated transcripts. But this is this is one part of it. So we did find some effects of all arrays, but it didn't help us identify latent being by itself. So what we did next is can we see any HIV cell? So in order to do so, we used HIV genome. And HIV genome has a bunch of bunch of proteins. So we held a lot of help from uh, Emory and from um, University of 
uh, North Carolina UNC and another one, um, USCSF, University of Southern UCSF, University of California, San Francisco. Thank you, yeah. Yes. So what they did is they artificially combined every gene in HIV and they put it together in one long genome. And we got that transcript and we plugged it into the system. That's what we found. We found that some cells had exactly that sequence. And this is what I, I wanted to tell you that we didn't care about all the clusters. Because we identified HIV cells only in two clusters. For instance, 11, 1, and 2, and there was very few in 5, and one cell here, one cell there, which uh, turned out to be relevant later. But what also we noticed is that some HIV cells were found in untreated cells. So now it's a question how? These are just blatant, this is blatantly infected cells from wing nodes. We didn't do anything to them. The only thing we did is grind the wing nodes, we put it through the filter. Got it from the suspension, and we just, just let it sit for 24 hours, and that's what we did. So, how can we identify HIV cells? And now you probably remember HIV can sporadic reactivate. Just by physical handling cells, can be important for reactivation. So, this probably not true latency. So, cells could be not in true latency because if you just touch them, they reactivate. And some of these cells could also be naturally latent because we don't know which of them actually were caused by latency reverse agent and which of them reactivated just like here. The whole point is we identified a lot of HIV cells. And that was great because nobody ever before identified cells in the Cells were identified in the disease of labeling of uh, people living with HIV cell lines. And some people work on uh, God and other people's tissues. So we were the first one to identify this was great, and of course, everybody started asking us questions. So, what? What's, what's now? Okay. So, now we looked at every single um, cluster and every single treatment. So, these are how many cells were identified in untreated cells, and these were identified in treatment. And as you can see, the majority was identified with cluster 1 and 2, and the majority with variants of ADC. So, addition of other drugs does not increase identification of HIV cells. So, again, it shows us again that variants of ADC is a great combination to, to work with. And now we really cared about the. Um, So this, this, I don't think it's the, um, these numbers have something to do with the true, so it's a contribution of each treatment to each process. So as you can see, also one of the actual Yes, so if we, if we look, this is supposed to be 100. So in the cluster 2, what, what is the composition? What cells contributed from each treatment? And it shows that what, it, what this table shows is that we didn't have, didn't have a dominant specific treatment in a specific cluster. So if you wanted to know, so if cells in cluster 2 is a specific treatment, because we know it's not specific donor anymore. We know it's, it's not specific uh, HIV, non HIV, it's overlapping. So what we notice is all of the contributors were equal, 30 something percent. That means that treatment was universally right out through, with an exception of 10, 11, and 16. But they were relevant. They were relevant. 16 did not have any HIV cells. 11 also didn't have HIV. Oh, 11 did. So 11 was variety of diseases. And 10 is going to be eliminated later. But when we look uh, further, it, it, we did really that matter. So now, what, what we ask next is, can we identify CD4 cell subsets? What it means that, if, if you remember from the lecture, CD4 has a lot, a lot of different subsets. It could be helper cells, or healer cells, or, or assistant cells, follicular helper cells, uh, TH1, 2, 3, 4, 17. It could be a lot of different subsets. And in addition, you go into a memory. A central memory, a central memory. So now, since we knew a transcript of every cell, 
It took us several years to identify this, but we started looking what are those cells. And this is what it shows. That's why that uh, cluster 10 was eliminated and cluster uh, 11, 0, and 27 were eliminated because they turned out to be not true CD4 cells. So we kept it right now only CD4 cells, and it's the same cluster. And if you see, a lot of them are naive cells. And a lot of cells in purple is the activated CD4 sequence for health. And a lot of them also see for memory. So what it shows is that these are the same treated cells, these are the same untreated cells. So if you think about a majority of reactivated cells, the latent to infected cells from HIV, is the activated CD4 T follicular helper cells, and some of them are naive. And here the majority of cells are found in this green cluster, which is T4 T cell memory. And that has been shown before with adult workers, not with cells, and even with um, bravery cells. That yes, CD4 cells is just it's just big name for them. But if you look at each subset of CD4, a lot of cells that harbor HIV were either follicular health cells or T cell memory cells. So in this sense, we will very very pleased to see this that we see similar things in periphery as we see in the lymph nodes. So that means that researchers still can do a lot of research with the cell line and with the cells from the blood, and that still would be translated to the organs. So that was a great discovery. But here, uh, uh, what another big component is that we said, let's just look at these at these um, activated cells, activated T-cell Just let's take just these cells and record them. And that's what we did. So now you see completely different clustering. Each cell is the each, uh, each doctor for each cell. And here we're looking at uh, people living without HIV. And these people living with HIV. So we just took those activated people with a health of cells and we wanted to say, what is the difference between them? And apparently, there was a big difference. We identified additional clusters when we separate that cell line, that, that cluster, into people living without HIV and people living with HIV. So some of the clusters are similar, but some was found only in people living with HIV. And we said, okay, let's just take this plot, take all these cells, and separate by three patients that we have there. And that's what we noticed. That some clusters, it's very, very you see, it's very hard to see in this clustering because it's very few cells. But what it shows is that some clusters were found in three donors, but some, for instance, here, cluster one, majority primarily found in patient one, and cluster zero primarily found in, in, in patient three. So if you put all of them together, these are all activated T-follicular health cells. But there are still differences between patients. And that was the big difference, and that was the big limitation for everybody who works with animals and work with the uh, tissues for patients, because we do not know how it will affect us. The way for us to know is sample more and more and more. And remember to define like that. We had three people living with HIV. We only took tiny little lymph nodes. From lymph nodes, we took one million cells, and we sequenced only 10 cells, um, uh, 20 cells, of cells, and in return, we got barely 10,000 from each patient. And in 10,000 patients, in 10,000 cells from each patient, we identified very, very few people cells that harbor in each training. So in order for us to find more, we just need to do the same thing even from the same patient, and we can increase our pool of infected cells. But if we increase the amount of patients, we can increase diversity. So this is very exciting, and at the same time, so very new that there are such a big uh, difference between the people, even three that we tested, that if we try to you know, go public with it or make a major uh, conclusion, it, it's not, it could not be true, or it could be not, not specifically true, because there is such a difference in a month or So uh, we already have funds to sequence more patients and even go ahead and, and uh, 
try to sample the same immune cells again um, to see if we can find even more differences or more similarities. But regardless, it's a great thing to see that, first of all, we have very similar effects in the lymph nodes compared to what was found in the brain rate. And second, it's the uh, differences between the patients that, that we need to consider. And then it's a very fresh uh, signature that we've got what is the difference is only in those HIV cells. Just, just let's say those 50 cells of HIV and compare to the rest. So it's called volcano class because usually it looks like volcanoes. But here we see kind of one sided is because there was a few upregulations only in cells with HIV. So as you can see, the HIV transcript that was very high, it means that it's upregulated. So on the left side, we see the rest of the cells. On the right side, you can see uh, cells with HIV. And we try to identify any possible um, transcripts that would be needed. Unfortunately, a lot of them don't even have names. That means that they were covered. People don't even know what they do in the cell. So that's why they were not assigned the name. They do not assign the function. And the way the way you continue is to uh, use the cell. You take cells. You knock it down using uh, RNA knockdown or CRISPR RNA knockdown or anything, and try to see if they'll survive. If every other function of cells would see that what what's the function of this protein from from this gene. But that's a very a lot of a lot of work. So right now we want to see or identify something we can already take. Um, so this is HIV positive cells, and I guess. So now we start looking, because we identified actually positive cells in different cell subsets, can we see something different in other, in specific cell subsets? And this is teeth, like, uh, uh, central membrane cells, only with HIV, compared to the rest of the T cell, or cell, uh, T cell membrane cells. This is T regulatory cells, and then always you see a few transcripts that were identified as significant upregulation. What, what we will do in the future is we can just look at every single of them and dive more in the literature. Maybe somebody already found this function. Maybe somebody already found it in other organs. Maybe somebody discovered it related to HIV somehow. So this, this is research where you take a lot of data that you receive from your analysis, and you go back into the lab and, and, uh, and the literature, and you read and start thinking, what can you do with this information? So of course it's not like in the book you found something in the given that's what it's not. So and another thing that I wanted to share real quick, I know it over time, but uh, uh, this is this is just a fact of uh, actually positive cells, actually negative cells, but this this is not. Very important thing that we found throughout the whole this thing is the TTR. Remember I said that T cell receptors is a tiny little thing that's refined in each cell and once CD4 cell ever encounter HIV, it keeps this tiny little part of the protein always on the cell. So you can actually look what a dominant epitope the cell recognizes. We are so curious, we want to see if we can find something in patients can maybe uh, similar between the patients. So again, this is how many cells were sequenced in the whole six people. Just 94,000 instead of 120,000. Out of all this gene expression, so the gene expression library, only 22 cells had T cell receptors. Something wrong. Out of T cell receptors, only, uh, only 12 of them had both gene expression and T cell receptors. So you would say, how is it possible? Well, when we make libraries, when we sequence cells, we have primary. Primary is a tiny little short part of the DNA that binds to the beginning of the cell and starts sequence. And one of them has a special sign that is gene expression, and another one binds it only to a T cell receptor start and is sequencing only T cell receptor. So that's why we have several libraries. So one of them is the complete whole genome, and another one binds only only T cell receptors. So it just happens that not every single cell that we have was sequenced for both. How is it happening? It's a science. You can't control it. That's what just happened. It happens in the tiny little tube. So again, out of 94,000 cells that were sequenced, only 22 had this receptor sequencing. So, and among them, only 12,000 had both. 
And in addition, if we look at the specificity, we need DDGA sequencing, and only 18 had that. So we limited our amount of finding the T the, the, uh, cell receptors of each cell. And what sadly, <laughs> if you look, this is our 57 HIV positive. So if you see that only two of them had both gene expression PCR and DDJ, and only two of them had gene expression and PCR without the DDJ, and two of them had the, uh, only PCR and no DDJ recommendation. So what I'm saying is, out of 57 cells, only two, only two cells that you can actually look at the specificity of HIV. This is not, you cannot compare it in a whole person, you cannot compare it among the people, and you definitely cannot compare it to what other people found in other tissues or in the immune work. But we said, what's the problem? And this is the problem. So again, this is very first control when the statistician received the sequencing data. Sequencing data is just a bunch of sequences. None of us will understand. It's just a bunch of sequences. Even statisticians don't understand what they do. They just put it in the system, in a software. And then they know how it runs. And they notice that it was very, very low, low, so low sequencing, but just very low number of steps all together with the phonotype. But it was, it was fine. It was a little bit bigger in untreated. So, and apparently, we thought, did we mess up the library? Somebody messed up when they prepared when they prepared them when they sequenced it. So we contacted the, the, the uh, sequencing board and they checked their controls and they said no, everything everything was fine, everything was fine, then something something not right. So we said, okay, let's just go back in the lab and do what we can do in the lab. What we did is we took the DNA, just a cell from the blood, we isolated the same CD4, and we did absolutely identical analysis as we did before. And we put in PHA. PHA, is, if you remember, it's the very first thing that we did previously. The harsh activator of CD4 cells, it was activated CD4 cells because we found zero HA. So, but it's no, it will never go in people. It, it's just, it will not, it will kill a person. But it's very harsh in CD4 activation. You know, if you got activated, it's you lost it. So that's what we did. And we used small cytometry to see what happens to the cell. So here, I'm looking at uh, mean fluorescence intensity. So we're just looking at expression of cell surface receptor. Every CD4 cell expresses CD3 and CD4. And you see, no matter which treatment we use, we still see CD3 and we still see CD4. And they're same, meaning that no matter which treatment we use, everything with cells were happy and healthy. And then we said, fine, what is the frequency? This, this MFI is just a number of receptors from each cell. The frequency is how many cells are present. And we saw that it was identical. So no matter which treatment we use, which is at the bottom, all of our cells still express in what they need to express. When we start looking specifically at PCR, you notice some regulation. So this is our untreated cell. And this is PHA, very first harsh activated and used previously. And that's why we never noticed some regulation of PCR before. So if we look at any treatment that we use, ketoburns and ATD or additional fodder, we don't regulate the expression. And I know frequency went down a little bit, but MFI is what's specifically important because it's looking at the cell. MFI is how many of those receptors on the same cell is down regulated. Versus frequency is how many cells still express. So MFI went down a bit. And when we do the sequencing in the lab, when we do the genomic sequencing in the PCR, this down regulation is enough because even if we try to sequence it, we don't know where the primer will bind. And that down regulation happens fast. So that's why we noticed and we finally realized what happened that these latency reversing agents, they activate transcription and translation, but ultimately they down regulate cell surface. CD4 expression. And yes, it doesn't really matter for HIV because the expression of viral protein still will happen. But we will never know what that cell was targeting. What part of 
way Chinese has some of civic use. So this was down regulated and it completely prevented us from finding out that information. Why do we care about information? Why do scientists care about PCR? Because if you have so many cells in your body that could be infected or could not be infected, but they find uh, they recognize specific part of HIV, that means it's a dominant part of HIV. And if uh, many patients by, uh, have cells specific to that dominant part of HIV, that part of HIV can be targeted somehow else. We can develop small molecule inhibitors. It's not blocking the whole virus, right? It's not a nice punish. But we will do something to stop, uh, to, to block that or somehow prevent this part of HIV to be done. And maybe affect somehow and help the immune system. So that's why scientists care about T cell inspectors, because they want to identify what's the dominant part of HIV. And now, if you're looking at down regulation, so we, before, as I said, we never cared about down regulation. You now look at it. In our section, just look at it. And look at this down regulation of pathways. T cell receptor complex, T cell receptor signaling pathway, T cell receptor activation. All of this, regardless which cluster we look at, regardless which treatment we look at, it's a down regulation of T cell. And as you remember, this is not a single transcript. This is all transcript pathways. We're looking at all of them regardless of the significance. And now here it is. So again, this, this analysis shows that we have to be very careful with down regulation of T-cell receptor. And then we said, wait a minute. And then somebody published about it. So we started speaking uh, deeper in the publication. And this is, I'm just showing you basic, basic interactions with the cell. So this is infected CD4 cells. What it does is expressing its uh, uh, molecules, MHC, and core activation molecules. And this is CD8 cells. CD8 cells are the key of Once the synapses happen, and recombination by T cell receptor on CD8 cells, CD8 cells, using this key cell receptor to recognize the tiny, tiny little part of the virus that is presented by infected cells. When this recognition happens, the DA cells release rhinos, this rhinos structure membrane and they kill C4 cells. But when we talk about down regulation of PCRs and we administer our right to the person, right? We cannot control that only CD4 can take it. Every cell can take it. So if we look at CD8 cells, that in the person who took this laser of reversing agent and down regulated CCR, this molecule, this molecule no longer expressed on the cell surface, this molecule no longer can recognize HIV on the infected cell. The sickness doesn't happen, there is no healing. So I know we're trying to activate HIV cells to force the expression of viral antigens, but in the meantime, we heal, we, we drop in other ways. Cells. And that's what actually was published before by, by, uh, by another group, not knowingly. So what they did is that they used HIV, CDL, which is CD8 cells, without any treatment. And this is how they were killing, to show you the graph. Once they mix cells, CD8 cells, with the target CD4 cells, they were just getting killed. But HIV infected cells, that's what happens when you mix CD8 and HIV infected. But what they did then is they pre-activated cells with different uh, places to reverse Safa is the same variety, which is a different name. I know well, scientists not why they did three different names the same thing. And then uh, two other drugs. And once they pre-activated them, you see how healing went down. And they didn't know. They didn't know what's happening in the paper. They were just saying something is odd with the system. Yes, it's primary cell fragmentation. We do it in vitro. They couldn't find an act, they couldn't find an uh, uh, explanation that happened in 2014. And then they said, okay, well, let's just lower uh, all the rate. It's just a lower amount of all the rate. So they use the same drug, but just give tiny, tiny little dose, like even smaller than we use. And still, it was degrading. So the tiny little dose of all the rate in vitro for cells, and unlike us, they treated the cells, they washed it all, and they mixed with target. So there was no alloy present 
to attack CD4 cells. See what I mean? And still is inhibited of CDA cell function. So this is, again, very uh, detrimental effect of biology that only can be identified from years of experiment. We're trying to uh, give our race to these cells to force reactivation and expression of HIV exosomes that could be recognized by antibodies. We're ultimately down-regulating CD4 uh, TC receptor. But this TC receptor can be down-regulated on killer cells as well. And once it's down-regulated, it will prevent different motor cues. So it's very important to uh, understand what we're trying to do, but not the harm or not male at all. So I guess this is the summary of my talk. My little over, but altogether, uh, the treatment with our combination, combination to reveal more HIV cells um, in the lymph node and uh, from people living with HIV cells compared to the treated. And the majority were identified here in the specific um, cell subset, such as T cell memory, T regular helper cells, and T regulatory cells. And uh, HIV cells were identified in all untreated samples and all three people living with HIV. So, and so now like, cells will be limited to down regulation. So there is a lot of future studies that I mentioned. I'm not going to go for it, but I do want to acknowledge. So it's a huge collaborative study. Uh, specifically, I'm thankful to all the participants and all the patients that are willing to right now we have a huge collection of lymph uh, for kidney and lung transplants here collected. So active call if you're interested in some clinical professional studies, uh, you could offer in some shadowing and uh, something for you to understand more. We work with surgeons and a huge group that I work with. That is with me Ferrari. Transcription uh, transcription for all of this analysis was done by Tyler uh, Chapin uh, and uh, Josh Granick. So huge collaboration with UNC, uh, Children Mercy, CSF, and work in summary. And thank you so much. Holy question. <laughs> if you have any more questions. I was just wondering, because you have those three patients that were different, do you think that's because of the swarming you were talking about with the mutations, or? I think differences between the patients is just cells, the patients, meaning that I don't, it could be because they have different viruses, but at this point, we're not sequencing the virus. We're just looking at the genes in cells in those patients. And we all different. Technically, uh, we all have the same process of our cells. Their growth, uh, replication, expansion. We all go into the same state. But somehow they were different. And that's actually a good question. So another explanation that we were suggested is that not necessarily we are so different, but more cells for the different cycle of reactivation. So if we start from the beginning, it's a transcription making RNA, then translation making protein and expression. We don't know which exactly step we we capture those cells because it's just a snapshot, right? So cells were reactivated and in a tube, and we just sequence them. So it could be some cells were re re reactivated faster. Um, uh, cells were activated slower, and that's why we it was a snapshot of, of, uh, of reactivation cycle. So that could be a difference. That it's not necessarily so it's not it has nothing to do with HIV, but it could be a different cell cycle stage in those patients. It's a good question actually, and we are also looking. Yes. Um, so do you? on what could be done to potentially counteract down regulation of TPR in the age. So the only thing to do now is uh, so we just presented this data with a huge meeting at UNC in our, uh, last week and groups that developed this latest server in ages now just looking into TPR so what they can do is it's a tiny tiny little drug and what they can do is introduce different, uh, uh, it's an organic drug, drug amoebic, 
kind of little carboxyl hydrogen bond, they can adjust it somehow to prevent that effect. So the only thing can be done is to modify that energy. Nothing you can do in the lab. So you want to maybe try to have it only a CD or some instrument? You won't be able to TCR such a uh, um, kind of uniform thing. It will be hard. And even on CD4, you don't want to downregulate CD4 TCR. You don't want to downregulate at all. But the only thing you would do is go back to organic lab, uh, change the structure of the tiny little molecule, and then try in the lab. But before, they were only focusing on all target effects, so they don't reactivate too much of genome and something related to HIV. And now they just need to also pay attention to the okay. yeah, when, when you're using such a small sample size, like six patients, um, you choose which patients you have <laughs> by the of the cell. <coughs> and sadly, that's not a good question. We just look at our repository when we got the leaks now. We had this C is a very collaborative work. We have surgeons who do surgery. In our lab, we had MDT students who was doing a little bit of research. She was related to the so she, whenever they would have surgery, and you would probably know you would go know the child. A lot of times when surgery happens at night. So somebody has to go at night, stand there in the surgery room, wait for them to excite the lymph nodes. And as you know, we all have a lot of fat in our body. So when they excite the lymph nodes, they just excite this big bulk of fat, and they just drop it on the table, and they just give it to you, and they continue with their surgery. And you just sit there and dig out the fat and try to find me some. And that's what that the MDT system did. She was just standing there for hours waiting for that chunk of tissue and we would dig it out. And sometimes she would find the lymph node. So it's not like it's a lymph node. Like when you sit, you're like, oh, lymph node. It's not. It's not. It's tiny, tiny. It's really hard. You really need to know what you're looking for. But she would dig out and sometimes she would find two lymph nodes. And she would find something, and then she would go back in the lab and she would harvest it and grind it, literally grinding like a grinder. And then you mash it through the mash and you incubate with it something, and you isolate the cells, and then you freeze them. And then before she freezes them, it's, it's a total, it's a, not even the same point, it's a total leaf cell cell. Just instead of tissue, it's a cell cell. And she would found that put them in the repository, and you would have Excel sheets with numbers, like patients, whatever, how many cells. So when we decided to do this experiment, we said, okay, well, we did this person before. He was healthy and healthy. We so, so we just said, let's choose these three who had the major. I think it's true. Okay, so we, we took the major amount of uh, uh, patients that had major amount of health. And that's what we did. And unfortunately, one patient, so in, at the same time, we sent those cells that said before to another lab to you. You broke them in the culture and see if any of them have uh, reactivatable virus. Not just virus, I told you, virus is so mutated, but even if it's pretty fun cell produce the virus, it might not be infectious. So it's just, it's just useless virus. So we send those cells to another lab, see if they can propagate it or expand it in the lab. And out of those three patients, only two did. And that's what we saw here. Out of three patients, only two of them had really great amount of uh, HIV uh, reactivated by themselves. And one patient didn't. And we said, what's wrong with that patient? Like, wow. It only had one or two cells reactivated. And then we combined the data with the expansion in vitro. And we noticed that that virus just more. So, yes. If that patient is infected with HIV, he's in latency, or she's in person is in latency. But when it was forced to reactivate, either in the lab or when we did lymph nodes, it was just a bad virus. So that patient, I mean, should survive with its own, if you start thinking about it, because that virus is just bad, bad virus. So that's why when, when, when we choose to, to go by monocell, but the proper way would be to do both, as, as I said before. Just send the cells to the lab, see if we can expand them, uh, 
for the virus to react to the ABC that can infect more, because that just means that virus is a it's really great infection part. If you have that and you take those cells, then you will detect more HIV cells. That requires a lot of work. So right now we have about 50, maybe 50 samples from 50 different patients, at least those from 50 different patients. Uh, and if we send all of them to the lab to see who of them propagate, first of all, it's a lot of time. Each of them takes about three to four weeks. It's a lot of money. And another thing, fortunately, from some of them, we collected just one vial. One, one frozen vial. So if we use that vial for propagation, there is nothing left to do any of it. Uh, so some of them collect three spots at most. So it's very little. It's very, very little. So we can do a limited amount of experiments. And even this, what I just showed you, Plus, um, 277. Transfer like this. Oh, this is a big yeah. for everything. Yeah. Luckily, everything is for free. The nation of uh, organs is free. The surgeon for raising work they do is free. The beach is to the class and we the process is free. I'm doing experiments, it's just whatever we do work for. But a lot of money is actual sequencing. Sequencing costs. About $127. <laughs> and analysis is done with collaboration with PFAR. So a lot of it is also covered by grants, so we don't really take it. So all of the costs went to prepare the libraries and sequence them. So it's a machine that should drop every single page together and sequence and sequence it for several hours and spit out a bunch of data. That's $127. So if you want more, everybody wants more. Even we want more. Every grant, so whenever these data presented and grants reviewers would like to um, see it, they want more. Everybody. And that's why they choose to they need more money. And if they, if they find it interesting and going somewhere, if they actually will, will find it more, we find more. But then there's all this research combined with non-human domains and embryo. They actually gave brains that they made the together to anyone. And instead of giving out of the team, they gave out the team agonist. It's, it's a small molecule that just forces yourself to produce yourself. Instead of actually solving the lab. And they also did this research. So they also found that you can react to it yourself. But they, they didn't kill the review part, unfortunately. They didn't know the nature of the part, but they definitely react to it. So it was, it, all of this combined together gives a lot of research. Do you do any research with the primates? We do. It's like, I put this in. Yeah. Uh, I do a lot, but I just don't handle it. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> no, just uh, last week I oh. said the building that houses the pregnant is across from the yes, from yes. So I pointed it out and I'm like, but no one talks about it. You know, isn't it like a little bit hush hush, the research with primates? I think just animal welfare and like taxes don't like it. So there's not like a website it's not too about Well, no, we do have YouTube on. DLAR, D L A R S. So I don't know, but we, even in the beginning of this year, so every year we have a lot of presentations that run by THCI. And this year we had a lot of presentations from QR from a uh, new uh, um, animal facility, and they said exactly what we have, the housing, what animals we should house. And starting two years ago now, we have Augustus. The tiny, tiny little cute monkey face, so cute. <laughs> uh, uh, they useful in, primarily in behavioral experiments rather than biological or biological we use non food primates or use a uh, We specifically had two Romeo and Peter monkeys. They were cute and little and I refused to see any pictures of them. I refused to go there. <laughs> but uh, we were getting a lot of blood from them and they were growing and they were not useful for us. It was unfortunately just like people. You never know who is susceptible to infection. 
So what we did is we took the cells that they blood and we tried to infect it in the lab. They were not infectable. No matter what we did. And that's why that's why it's like some people have pre existing immunity, just like some monkeys that are just that's why I said it's not that easy to get infected for it. Not just like without a virus. So they were not infectious. A lot. We tried a lot. But let, let's grow. Let let them grow for another year. We just beat them up. But it is. It's a very small facility. I don't think they can uh, uh, hold. They can hold a lot of animals. But they go in the room. They want to talk to me. Share some light. They go and walk. So they cannot just walk them out in the street. But they need sunlight. They need everything. I think they have like some rules and. Um, they walk them out and stay with them. They need to contact their go there and huddle them. And, yeah, so there is a lot of, not a lot, it's not huge, huge, huge centers like a lot of like others, but we have very few. Um, I'm sure it's not like, but am I screaming about it yet? It's a website. Yeah. Maybe because it's not an animal website, it's called DLAR. How would you know that? Did you look into, since they weren't like infectable, did you start looking into that at all? Or? So we don't because uh, it's not in the scope of our research. It's a very good question. And probably somebody who has more time would look into it. But it was just used for another study. I have one more question. Yeah, sorry. Um, because you were saying like the latency, how some of them could have just become active because we were handling them. Did you guys think of like another control that would fix that or? No, because that's the perfect control. Okay. You, you, it, it's good to see. We knew before that some patients can just react to it. And that's why it's called which. So some people in Marini, you probably heard it in the clinical studies or from some presentation you will hear in the future talk that some people on HIV and you hear blips of marine and you would see like but it's whatever it's like a hard big thing. So that's a graph usually represents the expression of virus. And usually it's zero or undetected. And then people will enter a trial therapy and then you keep like blip coming up. So you will be like you will hear this what is the blip? What is this what this spike mean? It means that out of the blue this person just reactivated HIV and they were able to measure viral load. And then, whenever they come for a next visit, they, it goes down and it just stays down. So, it's a sporadic reactivation. There's nothing you can do about it. Person already on anterior trial therapy. What happens? Nobody knows. Maybe he got flu. Maybe he got, uh, I don't know, stressed out. Or something happened to that person that just affected somehow the immune system and viral load. Up, although it's anterior trial there. So this is actually perfect control because this is what happened in the population. Just by handling, you will reactivate it, and it's actually good because you want to see another thing that I did at Holcomb, I still have to talk about this research, is that since we had cells reactivated in untreated cells, and we have cells reactivated in treated cells, what we do now is we're actually looking at gene expression analysis in those HIV cells and comparing. And the reason we do that is we wanted to see if cells were reactivated. Can we find a signature of genes or something that we can go now back to untreated cells and find them? And the reason we want to do this is because if now I know the signature of genes or proteins or something that are associated with latency or with a latently infected cell, can I go through a patient that is infected with HIV? Can I sample the plot? And can I find a signature? And if I do, that is a human infected cell that is a lady that can reactivate any time. Can I target it without reactivating cells? See what I mean? Can I target it without giving personal lady servers? Will I be able to kill it before it ever reactivates? So having those reactivated cells in the treated actually perfect control because now we compare gene expression and try to see they're similar or different and how they differ or how they sit. Oh, good question. Oh. All right, well, yeah. Well, thank you so yeah. much. I was really happy to be here. Bye, Mariana.
they began to be five million now. I'm sorry, the B5 million now. The B5, the B5. We are, when is it getting out? Yes, we, we are currently fighting it. So it takes time to get the baby. Because yes. everybody has a lot of yeah. When you when you publish the paper, you want to be very affirmative, it's sure. And right now we have more questions than we have answers. <laughs> So, no, um, the area group don't do it, so I'm putting publishing with that. Yeah, you should the power of 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 the power of